Hi there, I'm Eleanor from the KU Natural History Museum, and this is Pop-Up Science Online. The theme for today's program is rocks and minerals, which is my comfort zone because my educational background is in geology and paleontology. Do you enjoy examining interesting looking stones, pebbles, and maybe even invertebrate fossils? Kind of like this one? While out on social distance safe nature walks with your family? I know that I always like to stop and look at the rocks that I find on my walks with my dog. In today's pop-up science program, I'm going to give you a few tips for identifying rocks and minerals and some common fossils, and I'll show you how to make your own mineral ID kit using household items. So first, let's talk about rocks. There are three broad types of rocks, and those are igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Igneous rocks form as molten magma from inside the earth cools. So you can have igneous rocks forming when magma reaches the earth's surface, at which point we call it lava, like during a volcanic eruption or at a mid-ocean ridge on the ocean floor. Or you can have igneous rocks form when a big blob of molten magma ends up cooling slowly in place. Sedimentary rocks form in three different ways. The first way is when pre-existing rocks at the Earth's surface experience erosion and weathering, causing those pre-existing rocks to break down into lots of tiny pieces called clasts or sediments. Sand is an example of a sediment grain size. And then those sediment grains get cemented and glued together to form a new rock, such as sandstone. You can see an example here. The second way that sedimentary rocks can form is by chemical precipitation. This happens when water evaporates, typically from something like a lake or a shallow ocean, and the minerals that had been suspended in solution in the water get left over when all the water is gone. An example of a chemical sedimentary rock is the rock chert. The third way that sedimentary rocks can form is from the accumulation and compaction of organic material, such as plant or animal parts that get mixed with sediments, like in the case of fossiliferous limestone, which we have a lot of um, around here in eastern Kansas. Um, and it's filled with fossils of things like fusilinid foraminifera, which are single-celled protists that are now extinct and they're a little harder to see in this sample. Um, but you can also see brachiopods. Um, here's an example of a part of a brachiopod shell there down here as well. When Kansas was under the ocean about 315 million years ago during the Carboniferous period, there were numerous events like storms and hurricanes that would have stirred up the ocean killing the invertebrate organisms living there and also churning up the sediments. And then over time, the hard parts of those organisms became fossilized and cemented together with the limey mud sediment grains. The last rock type is metamorphic rock. And metamorphic rocks form when pre-existing rocks like igneous or sedimentary rocks experience high heat and high pressure. Where do rocks experience high heat and high pressure? in places like mountain ranges, which form when continents slowly but surely collide and essentially rumple up, which the forces of that slow motion collision cause heat and pressure. Or rocks can experience heat and pressure when ocean floor and continents meet. And this is called subduction, which is where the ocean floor can get pulled underneath a continent. And essentially it gets recycled creating more molten magma and that's how you get like the chain of volcanoes around the pacific ocean and that sets me up to mention the rock cycle which connects all three rock types any rock type can become another over time to identify rocks it is crucial to examine the grains and to notice their size whether they occur in layers or appear cemented together, and whether the grains appear stretched or sort of melted together. Igneous rocks will often have well-defined crystals, like we see here in this example. You can see how each of the crystals has well-defined edges. And um, we see that 
in rocks like granite, where you have very well defined crystal edges. Then um, sedimentary rocks often have lots of individual grains that are glued or cemented together. And we can see that represented in the model here. See all those individual grains. And so we see that with um, sandstone and limestone. So you can see this is the sandstone. And then here is the limestone. And then finally, with metamorphic rocks, what you want to look for are grains that appear stretched out or melted. Um, and this is because those metamorphic rocks have under, are, are rocks that have undergone change. Um, and in particular, we'll see that stretching effect happen with metamorphic rocks quite frequently. So you can see here, these are individual grains, but they got stretched out, and that is a result of um, pressure. So, for example, if you were to take a piece of igneous rock like granite and subject it to major one directional pressure, in response to that pressure, the grains are going to then kind of be squished and have to stretch out because there's only limited space. Using a rock guide will help you become more familiar with the many different kinds of rocks. For example, there's over 700 different igneous rocks alone. Now, let's talk about minerals. Minerals are the building blocks of rocks. Without minerals, we wouldn't have any rocks on Earth. The scientific definition of a mineral is a naturally occurring crystalline solid with a specific crystal structure and a definite chemical composition. Although there can be some minor chemical composition differences that lead to things like a range of color varieties among one particular mineral, like in the case of the mineral quartz. Quartz is composed of silicon and oxygen, so its chemical formula is SiO2. In its most pure form, quartz is transparent or clear. However, sometimes chemical impurities, like very tiny amounts of aluminum, can get incorporated into the chemical composition and cause different colors to occur. So it can be white, um, you can see that with uh, the milky quartz variety. There's also um, the pink version, and that's known as rose quartz. Um, there's the purple, purple version, um, that's known as amethyst. There's also um, yellow and orange versions, and that's known as citrine. Uh, there's even more color varieties as well. There are a lot of different minerals. More than 5,400 different minerals have been identified around the world. However, only about 10 minerals are considered common. In the Earth's continents, the most common mineral is quartz. So how do Earth scientists identify different minerals? It all relates back to each mineral's specific crystal structure and its chemical composition. Those characteristics define the properties of minerals, like how hard or soft a mineral is or whether a mineral is magnetic. Um, and all Earth scientists use these properties to identify different minerals. Um, there are several basic properties that we can use today um, for identification purposes. And the first one that we're gonna use is color, which honestly isn't always the most useful property because as we just learned, Minerals can sometimes come in a variety of different colors. The next property that we'll look at is luster. And luster is the way that light interacts with the surface of a mineral. Luster can either be metallic, um, and so here is an example of a metallic mineral. You can see that it's reflecting light the way that a metal would. Um, or it can be non-metallic. So we have a couple of different examples for non-metallic minerals here. Um, and if you would describe your mineral as non-metallic, you can go a little bit further, <clears throat> excuse me, and describe the luster as glassy, earthy, dull, pearly, oily, silky. There's many different ways that you can go on to describe a non 
metallic mineral. The next property is streak. And streak is the color of a mineral in powder form. And you can see a mineral streak by rubbing it against a ceramic plate called a streak plate. The next um, property that we're gonna look at is hardness. And hardness is whether a mineral is able to scratch or to be scratched by an object of known hardness. And if we look at Mohs, scale of relative hardness, and this is named after a German mineralogist, Frederick Mohs. Um, he was around all the way back in the mid 1800s. Um, he came up with this scale so that people could compare relative hardness. So on the one side, you have known objects like your fingernail, um, like a glass plate, or um, even a steel file. And then on the other side, he's got the minerals ranked from the softest at the bottom of talc all the way up to diamond, which is the hardest naturally occurring um, substance on earth. There are a few other um, characteristics that we won't have time to talk about today, but they are very important for mineral identification and they are crystal shape and structure, um, like the prism crystal shape that we see here in this um, quartz sample. This is the amethyst variety. Um, additionally, fracture or cleavage, which is the way that a mineral breaks. Um, specific gravity, which is a measure of density, and tenacity, which is the resistance to bending forces. So all of those things we won't be able to really get into today, but um, many of the other properties that we already talked about um, will be able to help us identify minerals. And lastly, there's a couple of special characteristics um, that happen in just certain minerals, like reaction to dilute acid, and that tells you whether the mineral is calcium carbonate based or not, um, as well as magnetism, which is whether a magnet is attracted, let's see if we can find one here, um, to a mineral. And that can be helpful, those two things can be helpful for identifying just very specific minerals. So to test these different mineral properties, you'll need to assemble a do-it-yourself mineral identification kit. And to do this, please go to our Museum from Home webpage and click on the Explore Geology tab to find the full instructions for the DIY mineral kit. Um, and you'll also find two other fun hands-on geology activities there as well. To assemble your kit, you'll need a magnifying glass and that replicates um, a geologist hand lens. And so the way that I would use this um, is I would hold it up really close to my eye and then bring the mineral or rock sample close to it. Then you'll need a piece of copper pipe or a penny would work too. Um, an iron nail, so something like this. Your own fingernail. A small mirror like from a uh, makeup compact or um, a piece of glass from an unused picture frame works really well. This replicates a geologist's glass plate. You'll also need the unglazed underside of a um, porcelain bowl, vase, or cup. And this is going to replicate a geologist's streak plate. You'll also need one teaspoon of white distilled vinegar. And this, um, so here we have that. <laughs> and this is going to replicate um, the dilute hydrochloric acid that a geologist would have in their field pack for um, testing for certain minerals. And then of course, you are gonna need your mystery mineral samples. You can either collect some from around your home or uh, you can also order a like a mystery mineral grab bag from different online stores. It's best if you create a chart to track your observations, especially because it will help you to narrow down the options when you compare your chart against the mineral identification key um, that's part of that um, activity that's on our website. And on your chart, you'll want to note the mineral's color. So is it brass yellow or is it clear um, or is it 
black in color or is it some other color? Um, you'll also want to note the luster. So remember that luster is going to either be metallic or non-metallic. So here's how you can see a mineral's streak color. What you're going to do is you're going to rub the mineral um, against that unglazed underside of the cup or the bowl and you're going to see what color is produced. So in this case, um, the, the color of the mineral as a whole is that brass yellow color, but the streak color is a dark brown. So those are two different colors. And so that's one of the um, features that can be used to, one of the properties that can be used to help identify a mineral. Then you're gonna to wanna to test the mineral's hardness. So first we'll look at Mohs um, hardness scale. And so remember we said that talc is the softest mineral. So we know that it can be scratched by your fingernail, which has a known hardness of 2.5. Um, another mineral that can be scratched by your fingernail is the mineral gypsum. Um, so I can, I can scratch that very easily with my just my pinky fingernail. However, if I try to scratch quartz with my fingernail, I can't. <laughs> that is too hard. Um, so then you would try another object like a penny or um, a glass. Uh, plate, for example. So um, glass has a known hardness of 5.5. So let's see if uh, quartz can scratch. And it sure does. So quartz is harder than 5.5. And um, then you would move up to, if you happen to have a steel um, file around, you could test it against that. And in this case, you would see, yep, the uh, mineral quartz is scratching the steel file. So that's how we know that this is a hardness of seven. One cool property to try testing for is reaction to acid. To do this, you're going to take um, the iron nail and um, see if you can make a scratch in the surface of the mineral. Um, some minerals may be too hard for this, so if you can't scratch it, then that's okay. And then what you're going to do, once you have a scratch in the surface, hopefully, uh, you're going to drip some of the um, acid, the vinegar in your case, on there. Hear all that sizzling? So that is a reaction um, so what I did was I used dilute hydrochloric acid because I'm a geologist and I have access to that. Um, when I put the dilute hydrochloric acid onto that mineral, it had a chemical reaction and it was releasing carbon dioxide and water. And so that's what all that fizzling was um, happening. And that's that reaction that I was um, expecting to see. Now, uh, in your case, because you'll be using vinegar, uh, it's not going to have as vigorous of a reaction. Um, you may want to use your magnifying glass in order to see any bubbles forming, um, but you should be able to see a little bit of reaction if it is a carbonate-based, calcium carbonate-based mineral. Um, if, it, if you don't have any reaction take place, then that means that your mineral is not calcium carbonate-based. So as you go through your mystery minerals, performing these tests and recording your observations, you can use the process of elimination against the provided um, mineral identification key. And that's going to enable you to um, figure out which minerals you have. And of course, I always like to recommend books. Um, so this guide, the field guide to North American um, rocks and minerals has come in very useful for me. And with that, it's time to go. I know that we covered a lot of information today. Uh, if you got a little confused anywhere, that's okay. You can always go back and rewatch parts of the video. I hope that you have fun examining the rocks and minerals around your home, and I hope that you have a great day. Bye.